You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Ryan Tejas is here across from me. I am here. Ryan? Yeah. Good to see you again. You know what's funny? What? Uh, Clowns? Buddy Hacker? There. Uh, so my this new car that I got now has CarPlay. And so I was list, I can now listen to texts that come in. And when it, my car reads your name back, it says Michael Rosenbaum. The robot says Baum. You know, Baum is the right way to say it. Yeah. Good for your robot. Yeah. The robot is calling you Baum. Wow. So there you go. Oh, I kind of like it. I think it's kind of neat. Yeah. Uh, great episode today. Um, James Marsders is in the house. And if you're here for James and you're a big fan and you like this podcast, you like this interview, uh, please give it a chance. Please listen to other people and um, listen to other interviews. I think you'll learn a lot. We talk about adversity and life and death and and a lot of mental health stuff. So if you like this, please support this little podcast. I'd appreciate it. You can go to um, my Instagram at the Michael Rosenbaum, my link tree for cameos. You can go there for to uh, listen to other interviews. We're on YouTube. We're everywhere. And also the cons that I'm at. And most importantly, if you want to join Patreon to support the podcast, because our patrons pretty much pay for this podcast. So if you want to give back and you like this, picture it as like a uh, a streamer, a cheap streamer. Now you can just, you know, give five bucks a month, a yeah. hundred bucks, a month, whatever you want to get, anything. And it keeps the podcast alive. And there's great tiers and so many perks that you get and your name Shout it out every episode and many other things. So take a look at it. Patreon.com slash inside of you. And you're really supporting the show and keeping it going. So we appreciate that. Um, also on the link tree on my Instagram, you'll see some new my new book, The Talented Farter, av- available on um, pre-order um, on Amazon. It's a fart book. It's a sound book. It's touching. It's sweet. And I think it's a great tabletop and gift for anyone. Really, I think you'll really like it. And Rosie's Puppy Fresh Breath, uh, one cap full in your dog's water, odorless, tasteless, and your dog's breath is going to be good. So you can kiss your dog and not go, holy crap, that was freaking awful. Because I've done that, and now I love kissing my dogs because <laughs> of Rosie's Puppy Fresh Breath. Um, let's get into this, man. James Marsders, you know him. I mean, he was obviously on Buffy, and he's done a lot of movies and things like that, but also Smallville, and um, he was fantastic on that. So, uh, yeah, we should probably get into that. Also, the Inside of You online store. Check out tons of cool merch. And uh, let's get inside of James Marsters. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. All right, Mr. Marsters. First Hi. of all, do, do people get you confused with James Marsden? All the time. Don't you hate it? Like, I just loved you in X Men. I'm like, oh, that was not that was not me. I like James Marsden though. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, he's fine. But you wish he didn't have a name like James he's taller, Mars. He's better looking, and he's been in bigger projects. Oh, he's better looking than all of us. Oh, son of a bitch. Son yeah. of a bitch. Just, you know, Westworld. That's West. when I really lost it. Yeah, he was really good. At- I thought that because I say I'm having James Marsters on the podcast. I go, oh, dude, he's great on that new. And I go, yeah, he's great, but he's not that. He's not James <laughs> Marsden. James Marsden's a lot younger than us, I think. He's probably 40s, early 40s. Probably, or he's just that pretty. Hey, fuck you, sad, James yeah. Marsden, for being so handsome. Son of and, a bitch. Um, yeah, but I, 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 can, I considered changing my name when I came down to Hollywood because Marsters – I was told sounds like mouse turds. And so I thought, you know, maybe you want to <laughs> really? take a look at that. I yeah. never thought mouse turds. <laughs> now you will. You'll never but what if it was head. James Wesley? That's what I thought. I should change That's a great name, yeah. James Wesley. I, I thought so But too, you've but... also changed your name or used pseudonyms for, for uh, like voiceover work. Like Dragon Ball? Didn't you like do use a different name? You're going to get me in trouble. Yeah. Will I? Yeah. Why yeah. does that get you in trouble? Well, because I changed my name. I just didn't want any credit on dragon ball because i wanted it just to be known to people at conventions to like real dragon ball super fans that i meet at conventions because i was getting people were coming up in my line going what happened with that film i was in this really uh not a good live action dragon ball movie called dragon ball evolution and it wasn't good oh boy was it not good it was really was the experience at least good bad offensively bad really oh my god i never heard of it thank god that's the one good thing about the movie is that not a lot of people saw it and if anyone's watching and everyone is don't go see that film um so Does the director would, get mad when you say that 
Well, he was a good guy, and he he did a lot of good movies, but uh, that was not one of them. I think he knows it too. I think we all know it. It's impossible not. Did to you know. have to promote it when it came out? Oh yeah. Oh, we went all over the world. We went to. Oh my god, we went to Japan, and they were very quiet. You know, there's like five thousand people watching the movie, and there they was like very polite applause. And I was like, well, they weren't very excited about us because <laughs> I was still in denial. Maybe this is a good film. You know. How you oh, so yeah, denial. in the beginning, you're like, oh wait, maybe, maybe I just I, I'm gonna... just too close to it. Exactly. And no. then you realize quickly, what's that <sighs> feeling like when there's five thousand people in an audience and they're not responding the way you were hoping? What does it do to you? Well, the first thing that I thought is, well, how rude. Well, they're not. <laughs> Japanese people are supposed to be so polite. I thought so. What are they you doing? Know. Or, you know, you go like, maybe it's cultural. Maybe silence is good in Japan. But it wasn't silence. It wasn't like respectful silence. It was It was more like, oh, well, now we get to leave. You know, and, and it was like this slow dawning, uh, sinking feeling that that it was just really horrible. I remember I went to the, the American uh, opening night and my son was like, I don't know. 12 years old at this time so it was the perfect age for this for dragon ball and we had been watching the anime together for years and uh and he and my daughter and i were all going out to see the film together on opening night and uh he's running ahead of us and i'm just like wait for us son wait for us and he leads us into the theater and it's packed and it's all teenage boys and their younger brothers, their tween brothers. And it smells like body odor and hot dogs. And it's mm -hmm. wonderful. I'm like, it's a hit. It's a hit. And we sit down and something, this voice goes off inside me. And I, and I think this is too good to be true. And I turn to the kid next to me and I go, hey, excuse me, man. Is, is this Dragon Ball? And he goes, what? And I go, is this Dragon Ball Evolution? He's like, no, man. This is Fast and Furious. Jesus, Dragon Ball. You were in the wrong yeah. theater? Yeah. So I get up and I and 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 I'm just thinking in my mind, oh please, just let there be a quarter of a house in 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 the no. correct theater. Let let there be at least a quarter of a house because I'm in on three picture deal and I and I have big plans for the rest of the the movies in this. And we get into the actual theater and there was four people, five people, including the three of us, on opening night. Were you horrified? I was horrified. It was so embarrassing. I was, I'm a dad and I'm showing off for my kids. Did your kid you know? like it? Yeah. He yeah. did. Yeah. Isn't well, that he was important? 12, you know, you know, and his dad was in, he was playing piccolo, you know, so it was, that was good. But, but, uh, yeah, the best thing is that if, if people haven't seen it, I hope that that stays that way. You know, so the, 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 we've the all point done that. Is, Go yeah, ahead. The point, the point is that I, I was tired of catching guff at, um, at conventions for this film. And so when I got a chance to be on Dragon Ball Super, I was like, oh, okay, let's do this little trick and let's, let's put a fake name so that, I can tell people, oh, just for conventions, I'm actually, you know, Zamasu in Dragon Ball Super. And just for you, it's an apology for that film. And, wow. Yeah, yeah. Did it work? Yeah. Yeah. You know. It's like secret I, knowledge. I, now, I, well, now, of course, everyone knows. because Right. Because I just said it. Thanks no, but lot, before Mike. that, they've known that. Um, I we, Look, we've all done movies that we're not proud of. We've all done them. I have. I did a movie. uh I've talked about this called Rave Macbeth, and it was in a rave, and I was Macbeth. Oh, no. And you know what? At the halfway point, the Germans decided to do a screening of it for everyone, but they put music over it and Pink Floyd. It's a very sort of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a very underground kind of cool, weird film. And at the halfway point, my friends were there. They came and visited the set, and they were all like, this is – Dude, this is gonna make you a star. This is unbelievable. This looks the look of it. The and then at the end of the movie, about a month later, the director called me. God rest his soul. He he passed away. Klaus Nossel, I think his name was. Klaus says, Michael, how are you doing? I'm like, good. Klaus, what's going on? He goes, well, I don't have good news. I go, well, what was the news? He goes, we lost the sound. I go, where? Which <laughs> scene? He goes the entire movie i go what what it was just unusable the sound something happened we have to do adr we have to loop the entire film every actor every character and i oh, go wow. my heart sank and i go i'm not i can't do this and i had to go into a studio for five straight days as the lead for seven eight hours a day and loop all my stuff to try and, and no matter what you do people know and I saw it 
and it was just, you know, I had these guttural screams and like, yeah. when you try to recreate that and it's ADR and it's over that, it just isn't. It, there, there are people who are good at ADR. I'm good. I'm not one of them. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I, I feel like what I'm trying to do when I'm, when I'm filming is to give myself a real experience that the camera can document. Now, I don't always do that. Oftentimes, I'm kind of posing, trying to look cool, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> but what all? I'm trying to do is just forget all of that and just experience something with another actor yeah. and not be aware of what's happening. And then something real happens and the camera can actually get what it's hungry for, which is something real to photograph. Yeah. And how do you recreate that when you in a booth doing ADR? You can ADR? create, recre it's know. okay if it's just intermittent or little bits, but when you're doing every moment every dial every huh oh yeah i can't oh my god i would have no idea how to do that it was an abomination the, and i didn't go to the premiere i said i'm not i mm. saw I saw it and i said i'm not going and uh i i didn't and um yeah it just it sucked because i thought it would it could have been a lot better it was just so different at the time and it just ruined the movie. And I remember one, I directed. It's going to look like a 70s porn, oh, porn God. film. And I also directed a movie called Back in the Day. It was this raunchy comedy that I love. And, but I remember, you know, they, a lot of distributors, they have, you know, in your deal, they say we're going to release it in 20 or 25 or 50 screens across the country. Yeah. You know, that was part of our deal. So they had to release it. So they, they put it in like these really whatever theaters, you know, around, you know. So my dad, was like my sister, Ava, he goes, Ava and I went and saw your movie. There was nobody in the theater. It was just us. And I go, yeah, it's, yeah. That's all he said to me. He didn't say anything else. God. I was like, all right, how's your day? Wow. Uh, it's par for the course. Thanks, you, you do Dad. Look, you've done a lot of things you're proud uh, of, right? You know, my, my parents never saw anything that I did. So Nothing. The, yeah. Are your parents still with us? No. That's why I can diss them. When, yeah. do, were you not close with your parents? Yeah, I was close, but they... I, it, I realized, you know, when when I the, the kinds of characters I'm playing, I wouldn't want to watch my son do the kind of things that I did on film. Why? And I wouldn't want to watch my dad do those kind of things because they're either violently evil or sexual, right? And that you don't you don't want to watch your dad. So you told them not to watch anything. No, no. I was like, have you seen it? And they're like, uh, no. Get around to it sometime. And they've never seen. They never saw your work. No, I used to, I kind of forced my son to watch some of it. And I think he would very politely sat through it, but I don't think he was interested. Like what? I would just show him the fight scenes. I would just say, you know, and finally he was, I, I, what was the, the role I got? I was, I was doing Torchwood for the BBC. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, dude. That's like the Doctor Who spinoff. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, this is the best role, man. I've got a samurai sword. I've got two guns, these Uzis. I've got, I've got this watch that sends me through time. And he's like, dad, do you win? He was like, he was like 13 years old. Do you win? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, you always get in a fight at the end of the thing and you always lose the fight. Or do you win or lose the fight? And I was like, uh, I lose. I'm, I'm not the hero. Oh, so it's like, come on. Next. I, want, I just still can't. He doesn't want to see his dad lose. No, one, no kid wants to but see that. They just want to see their dad. No, they want to see their dad win. My, so you never won? Did I ever win? Your a son fight? never looked at you and go, "You won, Dad." I did win a fight on Angel. I kicked Angel's ass on his own show. That was great. And your son liked that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you got you one. won. Yeah, I got one once. Yeah. But, but your parents ones. never saw any of your work, really. No. Did no. that upset you? Yes. Did you? But ever now I understand. At the time, at the time, I, I it did upset. Well, me. Well, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did they tell you why? No. No. I had to guess. So is, that's very hurtful. Well, I mean, well, it's like it hurts me too. And my, I'd rather, you know, it's funny. I don't even tell my dad when I'm really in anything anymore. Yeah. Because I, I don't want to set myself up for disaster. I don't want to set myself up for like, oh yeah, we saw that. That's that. I do it for different reasons. Yeah. Like yeah, I don't yeah. want to be crushed, but for you, I mean, did they ever see you perform live, like on a stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, times, yeah. and they like. Do they say yeah. they commend you? Yeah, yeah, more or less. You're yeah. still kind of thinking about this. <laughs> You're well, starting. I had, to I had not a great childhood, so like the fact that they didn't watch, 
that stuff, I, I wasn't surprised. If well, I put it that. Well, you say you like your parents, but you, now you're saying you had not, not had a great childhood. I didn't say I like my parents. <laughs> oh, so you didn't like? I like my dad. My you dad liked your dad. Great. You didn't like your mom. My mom was not a healthy person. No. It wasn't the best experience as a child. Not really. No. And you kind of let it go. And have you dealt with this stuff? Yeah. Do you go to therapy? I did. Um, Buffy sent me into therapy. Actually, uh, it, Buffy crushed me. And so, why? But this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know that so many of us are using BetterHelp. Ryan here. Ryan? Yep, I'm using it. Every week? Every week. And it helps you? Oh, yeah. It certainly does. I think we have things bottled up all the time that we just need to let go, and talking to someone truly, truly helps. Also, as an adult, do you make it a point to carve out time to learn new things as often as you'd like? Or is the day-to-day -day life so busy you feel like you'll never recapture that sense of childlike wonder. Kids are always learning and growing, but as adults, sometimes we lose that curiosity. What's something you'd like to learn? Gardening? A new language? Or maybe how to finally beat your best friend in bowling? Therapy can help you reconnect with your sense of wonder because your back-to-school era can come at any age. Therapy is helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. And it isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. Therapy is for everyone. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. If you don't like your therapist, you change it. Rediscover your curiosity with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash inside today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash inside. Well, there was this scene where I was, I was paired with Buffy and she breaks up with me and then I go and I... I kind of force myself on her and then she like kicks me through a wall and like like it it's a problematic scene for a lot of people who like the show um and it's the darkest professional day of my life um the thing is is that that uh one of the reasons that the buffy writing was so good was that they were being asked the writers were being asked to come up with their worst day the day that they don't talk about their dark secret the one that keeps them up at night um when they really hurt somebody or when they really got hurt or made a big mistake of some kind. Yeah. And then slap metaphoric fangs on top of that dark secret and tell everybody about it. So it's not really, it's not a show with a bunch of writers telling other people how to live their lives. Like this is the moral of the story. This is, it's just a bunch of human beings saying, hey man, this hurt earlier in my life. This, this was a sucky time in my life. Does anybody else have that experience? Yeah. And I think that's why it resonates and this this was one of the 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 women writers actually uh had come up with this idea um because in college she had gotten broken up with and she went to her ex's place and thought that if they made love one more time everything would be fixed and she kind of forced herself and he had to physically remove her from the from the premises and wow. that was just like one of the most painful memories of, her, of that time of her life and they thought that since buffy was a superhero that they could flip the sexes since since buffy could could defend herself very very easily from this they thought that they could they could have a man do it to a woman and it would be the same thing i think mm. and i went to them and i said you know guys we're, we're providing a vicarious experience for the audience that's storytelling in general we we tempt the audience behind the eyes of the lead so that each the audience can have that journey so hopefully people who are watching buffy while they're watching it they are buffy that's how the thing works like if i'm watching a james bond film i'm like oh they're shooting at me oh i better duck oh i have a gun oh i'm great with a gun i'm gonna kick it right ass. you know like that's that's how it works and so i was saying you know everyone who's watching buffy is buffy and they're not superheroes so i'm i'm doing this to every member of the audience and they're gonna have a very different reaction and this is spike buffy. yeah you didn't want to do it. I, no, like I don't even, I don't like, like sexual predation scenes, anything that has that to do with it. I don't audition for those things. If it's, if there's a movie with that kind of material, I don't go to see the movie. If it pops up on television, I've got to turn the television off before I break it. I have a very visceral reaction to that stuff. 
And I was contracted to do this. I I couldn't yeah. say no. And so I I remember <laughs> I remember making my entrance for the first line of the scene and I have a um I have a, a an injury on my neck from doing too many stunts um and sometimes it pops off and it'll just it'll pop and I'm I'm just like you know and I um like my tongue goes back on my mouth and my, oh. uh what do they call that? It's not stenosis. You know, it's, yeah, it's it's something. It's a like a pulled nerve or something. Yeah. Whatever. Um and it popped off like a gunshot. And I and I went like that, and I just collapsed to the floor. <laughs> I was like, "Hello, Buffy!" Crack! <laughs> just down. Where was everybody yeah, just like, freaking out? Yeah, they all surrounded me. Are you okay? You know, and I'm like, I, I guess I'm kind of tense right now. You know, and and we we got the scene in the can, and and it was it was hell. It was I was I was in a personal hell. Were you also in personal hell? Not only because you had to do it, <sighs> but because the repercussions of doing that would would would. Um, sort of you make people dislike your character i wasn't thinking of that i was just i was just having to do that to sarah you know i was just having to live through that reality like, it's just that's something the that film you, acting right. is that you make it real for yourself it's like that's that's the whole point if it's going to work right and if, if the scenes because you don't like you don't want to film a scene like that and then have it suck on top of having to do it so you right. want it to actually be good so i was really releasing into the you know oh god um like it's still i feel i was like pain yeah and you I went to like, therapy because of that yeah like i was i was i was like doing a take and then going in the corner of the set and and going into the fetal position on the cement oh my god did, did sarah so come up to you and say are yeah, you okay yeah they were all worried you know they're like be worried i'm not okay you're like i don't like doing this yeah yeah so you're doing something against your will yeah very much so the good thing is is that um that i found a really good therapist and in putting me back together from that got into all the other stuff as their good therapists will do right and uh, i was very painful and very destabilizing but i came out of it a happy per much happier person right so it's all good i mean it all led me man to being that's, that's amazing how today. a scene can affect you a moment on a, on screen that's not real that you have this visceral feeling and just um disdain for that well, obviously we all yeah. have disdain for that sort of behavior but for to even play a character like that to play it you know um yeah to this day there's a little tiny sunny dale in my mind and there's a little tiny spike and he's in love with a little tiny buffy to this day it's it's still real like i've i created a world in my mind that's how you do it that's 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 the method basically yeah. of acting is you make you make a little playpen for yourself and you you put a, as much detail into that as you can so that you can just go play in that in that little box and once it's constructed it's it's there what has changed in you over the years coming to hollywood going to juilliard going to you know studying theater doing all this shakespeare and all these things and having a band and being on a hit show and doing movies and all these things that sort of feeling or passion or mentality during that time period yeah juxtaposed to 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 now to how you feel about all of it now and how you deal with things now i i think i was i had to do this i had to be successful i had to prove myself i had to and slowly that starts to go away a little yeah. bit or a lot and it also um what goes away is that sort of freeness of not being worried not being scared not just going and doing it and then the older you get we think about things more and more and it hinders us from achieving our greatest achievements yeah and i just want to know your journey in terms of like who you were then and now if you look at yourself as i don't even know how old you are probably my age but you know what i mean i'm 62 what so, yeah yeah you're 62? I'm 60. Well, maybe. I'm I would have thought you were like 52. So old that I don't know how old I am. You're I not born, old. I was born in 1962. I was born so in 72. So how old am I? Am I 61 or 62? You're, August 20th. You're going to be 62. I'm going to be 62. And I'm guessing September. August. Very oh, good. Well, that was close. Very was close. close. Yeah. August 14th. Why did you pick September? 14th? That's amazing. 20th. Damn. Wasn't See? close. Long again. I know. But go ahead. So you, you kind of get what I'm asking. I just forgot what you were asking. No, um, um, I uh, I was driven like you 
like a lot of people who come down with with some ability and some experience and uh uh I think what's changed is that I've I've come to realize that anything external is not going to make me happy. It it can make me pleased, it can make me comfortable, it can make me self-satisfied. But that's different than happiness. Um and and I find happiness in coming into contact with other people. Like today, I'm happy cuz I'm seeing my friends, it's interactions, talking. it's moments. Yeah. It's... Yeah, and most of most of the way the best way that I've found to come in contact with other people is to help them or to allow them to help me. Uh and it's easier for me to help people than allow myself That's to be helped right. when I'm yeah. working on it. Yeah. Um but that works that works really well actually. Uh and like if I buy something, like we're talking about external things cuz I thought that external I thought that external success professionally would make me happy. Yeah. Didn't. Um, but just the analogy being like, like something external, like something buying something. So if I buy a toy, uh, it might make me happy, well, not happy, pleased, entertained. Momentarily. Maybe six hours. Yeah. You know, I could buy a car, probably six weeks I'd get out of it. Like, well, I'm driving my new car. I'm a new car. Yeah. yeah. And after six weeks, I'm like, yeah, I got to get to the grocery store. I could buy a house. And I'll bet you six months into living in that house, it would just fade into the background of normalcy and I would be worrying about something. Uh, it doesn't last. Um, and so uh, I guess that's, that's the main thing is, is that, that I've learned how to, or I'm starting to accept myself and I'm starting to learn that I just need people. Why do, we, why do we start so late? Why, do we, why does it take so long to figure out what's important? uh for me i don't know i i think other people might get to that earlier but i think i, that, I, 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 know, I i'm man. so I just, envious of like certain yeah. people that have figured it out or at least my perception is that they figured it out or just that they figured it out more than i have at this moment i i think it takes like self self-acceptance i think i think it's normal that someone it takes until middle age to get there i think i think i hear that from a lot of people I think, I think that we're trained in this culture to uh, think that we can buy our happiness. I think we're told that all the time with commercials. So yeah. it's not surprising that it's taken me this long to be like, hey, wait a minute, commercials are lying, actually. Like, I can't buy a car and get a good wife. I don't think that doesn't yeah. really work that way, does it? You know? Damn, really? That sucks. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel the same way. Um, you know, I buy things, I have a lot of posters and things, and, you know they're exciting for six hours, like you say, or and 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 I and I really like things. I like you know I don't go out and I'm not a materialistic person where I have to get the fanciest things. I'm more yeah. like I'm still that dude. I'm still yeah. that guy. In and you college. have a great place, man. Like, and I love it. And I, love I do your house. It's a wonderful place, and it makes Thank me you. feel welcome. Well, I have the same thing. Like I, I have a house where I when I go into it, I feel welcomed. I feel like I'm kind of giving myself some love. And I spent some time decorating. I didn't spend a whole lot of money on it. Can you at least sometimes take a step back? And you don't have to do it often because it'd probably be weird. But sort of look from the outside in and say, hey, you've had a great career. You made a lot of money. You have a lot of fans. This is great. Be proud of yourself. I am just amazed by the whole roller coaster of my life. The whole thing. Because I... The years before I came to Los Angeles was was real poverty because I was a theater actor and and I was about as successful as anybody else. But you're still making three seventy five to five hundred dollars a week. I mean, this is a while. They're probably making a little more now, but right. not a whole lot. Um, so like fifteen years, I didn't have a dentist. You know, no no health insurance at all. So I was I was one injury away from homelessness for fifteen years. You know, like that's that's pretty intense. Um, but you don't think about it. I do. You you did think the about it. The whole thing. And when I, I look back on my life, I'm like, wow, what a roller coaster. I mean, did you think about it then as much as you do now? Every second, really. This and I didn't really realize it until I got health insurance and it went away. It was like this background tension. I was just like, I'm relaxed. Why am I so relaxed? Oh, that's why. Right. Yeah. And I'm not. I, I have enough in the bank that I that I can pay rent. I don't have to worry about 
Yeah, it was. It's you pay rent on the first, and then you start working trying to scrounge it together. And then the first comes, and you don't have it. And you're like, oh, I think we got a week. I think we got we got three or four days to get it together. And you're yeah. scrounging more. And like my first wife and I, we for, there was a period where we ate oatmeal for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And Delicious. then we got got sick of that. We'd switch over to cream of wheat, oh. breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we got sick of that. We'd go back to oatmeal. That's we have Jeez. no money at all. Yeah, yeah. And so, so like, so my life has just been this incredible twisting, turning. Can you deal ride, with? Man. Uh, obviously, in the past, when you're the roller coaster, when you're going down, whether uh -huh. it's a divorce or whatever it is, or whatever the moment on Buffy and going to therapy, um, do you did you deal with it a lot differently than you do now? Like, Very maybe did you use alcohol then? Did you use any? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, like anything external. Yeah. Alcohol. Just to disappear, to be numb. Yeah. 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 And do you do that anymore? No. No. I had to clean up my act, man. I had to. I I, I remember telling my father I was helping him. Uh, he had Parkinson's. So for 10 years, I was helping him uh, financially a lot. And then a lot, I would go and make sure he was okay and make sure the house was okay and everything. And his doctor was uh, telling me, you know, you got to get him off sugar. And I was telling him, Dad... We can all have good health outcomes, but as we get older, the margin for error gets a lot less. So we got to make really smart choices. And for you right now, you just got to quit sugar. And he never could. But I, but what it did for me was I was like, you know, I should take my own advice. Yeah. And I should start cleaning up my act. So at this point, I don't eat sugar. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't. Do you I'm think that cutting out sugar is honestly, do you think it made a world of difference in your life? Phenomenal. Yeah just just incredible. how Red. how what do you feel what di how differently do you feel um i just i feel younger i feel more energetic you don't get uh, tired as much at all yeah um, do you have pains less pains yeah do you think it has to do with inflammation Very and like much. pains and aches sugar is an inflammatory so so it, i shouldn't drink coke zeros well they taste like crap i love the way no. it's re crisp and refreshing dude the first sip of a coke to me is just like uh I, get a I'm in soda ecstasy. stream dude i know but i don't i don't drink it a lot but boy you could i have a soda stream i'm addicted to like, popcorn and, and, and soda but, me too but i make my own and i, I make my own too. i have grapefruit soda and then i have a cherry soda and then i have lemon lime soda and i'm like i have a little but they're without sugar soda bar yeah no 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 sugar at all. but how do you make those or you just buy you just you just like filter your water and put it in this little the soda stream thing and you have a little oh, you know yeah. canisters carbonates for it. <laughs> and you can carbonate it like i carbonate mine like it punches you in the face can now. you carbonate cranberry juice i have never tried you could try it why not you know what you can? You got a soda stream you could uh, afford to break the thing yeah you know what i wanted to ask you i, I don't re remember us talking too much about it but i know you went to juilliard for two years yeah who was going to juilliard with you any famous people while you were there ving reams was wow there? i didn't uh, know he went to yeah he went to juilliard I remember, yeah you never would have thought he went to right? juilliard Arby's. i remember we have the meats he went <laughs> he went he went uh he was all what's well, mission impossible did he graduate uh, oh yeah oh yeah i did you not. saw him perform you acted oh, with yeah. him he was incredible so good i remember i went up to his place in harlem to watch the the final episode of um mash because I didn't have a television show. And him, Michael Beach, who's uh, also a very uh, uh, talented and successful actor, they were roommates up in Harlem. And uh, it got over like at 11 or 12 o'clock at night for some reason. And I was like, and I said to Mike, okay, you're going to walk me to the subway. And they turned and they were like, why? And they, and, and they said, uh, and I was like, well, it's Harlem, dude. It's midnight. I'm not saying I'm a white boy. And they were just like, oh, my God. And Ving was like, okay, dude, I'm going to help you. I'm going to show you my neighborhood. We're going to take a walk before we take you to the subway. I'm going to walk you around my neighborhood. And don't worry, we're going to follow you like half a block behind so that if anything happens to you, if you'll be happens. safe. Don't worry. But you will find that it's a really nice neighborhood and you're totally fine. Okay. And they did it. And I walked around for 45 minutes in Harlem at midnight and I was totally fine and it was amazing. And then they got me to the subway. Did you, 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 you haven't talked to him since? Uh, since school? I don't think so. If you saw him, would it be like, hey, probably, yeah. 
I'm just trying to think. There was a there, we went back. There was a 50th anniversary for Juilliard. Uh, he might have been there, but I don't think I saw him. And who else was there? Um, what's the name of that? What was the woman uh, in Jessica Chastain? <laughs> Mate, no. Um, um, uh, who's what's the Ryan Reynolds superhero thing? Uh, Marina Backrin. De- de- yeah. Marina Backrin. Is it the, the wife? girlfriend? Yeah, the, the, girlfriend. Wife, the girlfriend. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's. Marina she's went to wonderful. Juilliard. Yeah, and she was also in the Joss Whedon. She was film, in my too. movie. I didn't yeah, know she was she's Juilliard, incredible. Though. Yeah, she's incredible. Yeah, I love Marina nice background. She's just a wonderful person. Yeah, she. We had a nice. But you got kicked out after two years. Oh yeah. Oh Why yeah. did you On get kicked ear. out? They hated me. Why? Uh, the first the first play that we did was called the Discovery Play, and we were doing Troilus and Cressida, which is not one of Shakespeare's better plays. It's one of his worst plays. Then why do it? Good question. And we were getting, <laughs> we were getting no direction. We were getting uh, Marion Seldes, uh, who's one of the best Broadway actors. She's gone now, but she was one of the best Broadway actors alive. She was an amazing actor. And as good as she was as an actor, she was that bad as a director. She was freaking horrible, giving us nothing. She would just keep saying, oh, my birds, keep experimenting. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. And I'm watching this happen. And we are three days away from uh, opening. And... We are not getting a real audience. It's just the teachers coming in to see us, you know, and that's right. it. But but I feel a responsibility to the audience because it's been drilled into me that the human beings are going to spend three hours of their lives with you. You better not waste their time. That this has been just ingrained in me, and I just come from a uh, an apprenticeship at a really good theater in California called uh, the um, Pacific Conservatory of the Performing Arts, um, and professional actors some of the best west coast actors it was voted the third best uh west coast theater and you know it it really good stuff and i'm used to that and so we're doing this play and it's just god awful and i'm like i'm at juilliard this should this should be one of the best plays i've ever done in my life like what is going on and i thought well there's something there's something happening that i'm not understanding well maybe it's maybe it's the title is it's called the discovery play i'll ask why it's called the discovery play and i asked the staff why it's called the Discovery Place. No one knew. Mm. And I, I was like, okay, they know. They're not telling me. This is ridiculous. And I thought, okay, I have to figure it out. It's a, it's a, they're, they're, something's going on. Maybe they're setting you up to fail. I don't know. And so I thought maybe it's not our discovery. I was thinking of this like we were supposed to discover something. Well, maybe it's actually the staff is going to discover who we are. And maybe the whole point is left to our own devices that they're going to discover, are we the kind of class that's wanted to tell a story or are we just going to jerk around mm. if they let us? And I was like, well, they got me. So I stood up three days before opening. And I said, this is the biggest piece of crap I have ever been in. We are horrible. In, in front have, of everybody. Yeah. We have got to we have got to tell this story. We've got to make choices. We have got to remember that people are going to spend their lives three hours with us. And it is a crime to waste that time. So we have got to give some form to this thing. What do they say? <sighs> Mr. Masters. Like, oh my God. I was out. R- I was wrong about Damn the whole spot. discovery play thing. That was not the that was not what was going on. What was going on, I think, is that because they weren't having a real audience, they couldn't get real directors to come do this. And so they were just getting anyone they could to direct, and they just got Marion to do it. And she just frankly doesn't have a very good And director. it was awful. It was just terrible. But I got they thought of me as this opinionated, uh, cocky uh, uh, actor that no one that and so they they just they rode me for two years and then kicked me out rode you like just were hard on you yeah 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 i got a were you upset when they kicked you out oh massively yeah i almost jumped off the building i went up there and almost threw myself off the roof you were that upset really (laughs) who told you you remember the the, the well they said you're not an actor you have no instinct for acting and you need to quit before you get bitter and you're horrible that's what they said? Yeah, yeah. They told you that you're awful. <laughs> oh, yeah, in no uncertain terms. How many people told you this in the... the- well, I was awful. It, the thing that happened was is that they were, because they were writing me, theater had always been my safe space. It was always the place that I could go to because my family was not healthy, so I could go to theater and have, have a Escape. harmonious 
Yeah. Uh, uh, well, it was really about being with a group of people that were working together to make something to, to to give a gift to the audience. Right. And that was kind of an alternate family for me. So, because in Juilliard it was just hammering me the whole time, I just collapsed creatively. And so the best the best acting I did at Juilliard was my was the the monologue I did to get in. It was How many times did you audition? That. Just once. You just gave once. one monologue, and what monologue was that? Oh, I forget. Was it Shakespeare? It was one Shakespeare and one modern. I have no idea. But you killed it. Obviously. I guess. I don't know. Were you surprised you got in? Or did you like... No. (laughs) Really? (laughs) No. I... uh, in high school, I, 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 they interviewed me for the school paper, and I said, "I want to. My plan is to go to the Pacific Conservative the, uh, Performing Arts, and then go to Juilliard." That was what I was. That was that's what I thought I should do. And so when it when it happened that way, I was like, "Yeah, okay. I think I think I think the plan's working." All right. So you're 60 years old now, which yeah. is around 60. Yeah. Uh, you've had a roller coaster of a life, a lot of great moments. You, yeah. are, I mean, I hate to say, are you happy? But are you, are you uh, somewhat content? Are you more relaxed now? Are you? Do you still stress a lot? No, I am. I am. If anything, I feel guilty that I have it so good. Like I don't know how. How does someone who decides to be an actor have two kids in college? and be able to pay that. Mm, if, if, you, if you make the decision to be an actor, the deal is poverty. And you cannot expect to have kids and be able to provide well for them. I mean, like, if there are any actors out yeah. there that are, that, are, that are doing this, hats off to you. But, but um, I, I don't know that I, I, I just, I, I don't understand. How did I get here, you know? And 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 the answer, how did I get here, is really one audition one day for Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That led to everything else, you know. But for that, I would have been just doing recurring roles and guest stars like I was doing when I auditioned for Buffy. And I would have been making, I would be, I'd be selling cars. I I think that too. I think if you look back, if you looked at me in high school, yeah, you would never think I would have done anything. I worked, would have worked at Wesselman's grocery store, no. or I would have been a DJ at the roller rink, mechanic at the roll at the uh, at the uh, go kart. I track. picture you as like always this lovable maniac at the I center was the of all attention. Shortest kid. I wasn't popular. I was wow. just like I was. No one listened to me. My family. It was like I didn't exist. And wow. if I look back at that kid crying in his room or watching horror movies, there's no way I would have bet on him. No, on my on my holy crap hand to god yeah. um and so when i look at that i look at this it's almost like i think in life it's like a car you know you have a car and it, it goes it, the battery dies yeah and you get jump started yeah. and you go again and there were times where i think i had a few of those jump starts that kept me going just when I thought it, you know, it was here, something would happen, fate, whatever. Someone would say, Hey, this, and that would go in a direction. And just when I thought I was going to give up, so it was almost like it was destiny to, to do something, whether it was to be, um, it just, I, I, I can't explain it. Yeah. But, um, I you know, found a way yeah. to be beautiful. You found. A way. I guess I'm still nice. figuring it all out. I think I was so immature growing up, and still immature now. But I think um, it's taken me so long to figure this out to yeah. really understand what life's about. And I'm, I'm look, I'm, I'm still trying to get. There. I think that's true with a lot of artists. I think that we, we often, our childhood was not really great, and we found a way, whether that's acting or painting or, or sculpture or whatever it is, music, we find a way to be beautiful and, and powerful. And you know what? Being around people who want you to be funny, powerful, uh, be yourself. And when I say powerful, I don't mean like socially powerful. No, I mean but just, just like having so, some personal um, uh, power, some, I don't know. Like just having empower. Like empowerment yeah you know empowerment. empowered and but yeah. those people along the way they give you that juice they give you that jump yeah. start and if you have a couple of those people in your life 
it helps you get through life and hopefully be the best you can yeah. be and be successful, but also then surrounding yourself with those people, with those people who believe in you and you feel that um, will be there even if it all goes away. Because it, it all, a lot of it goes away. I, I had a trajectory at one time that, you know, this is, you're just going to keep, and I'm like, you know, and then it kind of, you know, plateaued. Yeah. And it was like, okay, this is, and this is great. Yeah. And I work and I do my podcast and I write and I, but it's, you know, there were people then where there was like at the height of Smallville and height, whatever, and they were there. And then when that kind of went away, they kind of, yeah. latched onto the next person yeah. and, you know and <laughs> yeah. but now you know how to i know how to read people i'm a really good judge of character mm -hmm. maybe you know but maybe that's why i'm single <laughs> tell me about your podcast <laughs> tell me about your podcast that was the best joke <laughs> um uh doing a podcast called schmackters with schmackters. mark divine and jason de filippo uh, uh, we do half hour. We do just audible cut podcast because what we're doing now with all the lights and all the cameras Too much. and stuff, I'm like, you don't need don't it. Just we'll, we'll just do gonna... that. Um, so uh, Mark Devine is the funniest man I've ever met in my life. And I met him when I was taking myself very seriously and I had lost my sense of humor. Parenthood did that to me. <laughs> I think you get more of a sense of humor with Parenthood. You really you would, would hope give you, so. You yeah. hope so. Yeah. But I, you know, between between the experiences of 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 um so, be, uh, celebrity, which tempts me to take myself seriously, yes. or did you know, and then parenthood, which is not easy, um, and I wasn't perfect at it, um, uh, I was I had no sense of humor. I had lost it, and then I met Mark, and I I just I just started ripping off his jokes. And I would tell his jokes back to him and he would laugh politely. And I would just, I just adopted the character of Mark Devine and just tried that on and rediscovered my own sense of humor through that. And he really saved me as far as that side of me. You needed and this, didn't I you? I really did. Yeah. He was one of these people that, that you the talk jump about. Start. Yeah. He's that, there's a big jump start in my life. And, um, we became fast friends and, uh, then he moved to, uh, Atlanta because his wife, he had had a son, and his wife wanted to be near her 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 family to raise the kid, and and he he called me. He's like, James, I don't feel funny anymore. I'm doing Parenthood, and it's hard, and I've lost my sense of humor, and and I and I want to do a project with you, and and because I I miss you, and I miss talking with you, and I want to I want to get back, and and uh, so we put together this idea where we just sit down. And and uh, take questions from uh, from the house, you know, from the audience, and we just expound. The, the basic premise is: Are all actors self entitled pricks, uh, or do they actually have any interesting ideas in their head? That's awesome. Yeah, and or is it a little bit of both, maybe? Yeah, That's and a, you know, yeah. when I was listening to you, you I, I listened to one episode, and it just it felt so just raw. Yeah. It felt raw, and like you were doing your thing and and i could tell there was so much enjoyment yeah and i think that's so important when you're doing a podcast that if people know that you're confident in what you're doing and you're enjoying it and you have something to say that i mean you've won that's the thing is like when mark and i get together everyone's just like we love you too you know, like just when you guys are like bouncing off each other it's just amazing and so i knew that the magic is just mark and i talking about anything really because you can tell we're having fun we're enjoying ourselves. And uh, and it was just finding a format that would allow us to do that. How many episodes have you done? It. Done 10. And Is it hard and, or you just Zoom? Just Zoom. And then edit. Oh, it's great. Because I get to go into a podcast studio and I have like a little light and a professional microphone and, a little, and I got the little coffee and my, I've got that little mints in case my tongue gets dry. Right. You know, and Mark is in his house, you know, and he's on his computer. <laughs> and you just shoot ideas like, hey, let's talk about this today. Let's. Yeah. Or like at the, you know, we're, we, we, we get the um, call ins, the call ups. Yeah. We have call ups and then, uh, or we're getting call ups. Phone That's a new thing that we're getting in. Right. Uh, but just, you know, questions off the, you know, the people will ask us questions. They'll go into, schmackers.com by the way it's s c h m actors like schmucks Sh like yes but it's schmackters. a lot of people think it's maybe s h mactors schmackters s c h m a s 
M A C T R S. Yeah. Very good. I yes, couldn't do yes. that. Yeah. So, yeah. but so, so schmackers.com, you can go in there and put questions in, and then we go through questions and answer some of them on the show. And you so. usually, are there certain questions you won't answer, or you're like, no, no, there's just is something you're looking for when people. Yeah. Are- like, like, like most of it, there's not much that we're like, oh, we can't talk about that, but there are th- some things that we're, we think that we could get more mileage out of. It's kind of weird. We did, we finally did a buff, Buffy question, and then Mark just went off and interviewed me because he wanted to know the minutia, minute to minute, of auditioning for the role, getting the role, driving to the first, you know, like all the little did tiny things. Did you love it? That, yeah. Like, like, I've talked a lot about Buffy, but he, he's an actor, and because he was on, um, he was on uh, a lot of, a lot of, oh my God, I forget, a lot of really good stuff. Right. IMDb. Mark yes. Divine. Mark Divine. Um, uh, so he knew really good questions to ask, and he got me to 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 really remember things I hadn't thought about in years. And we did two shows off of one question, and people loved it. I, yeah, yeah, because they're just all this new stuff. Schmackers, and they can listen anywhere, any platform, yeah, anywhere you get your. Podcasts. Who edits it? Uh, Jason. Jason does it. Really? Yeah, yeah. I help him, but he does most of it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Uh, all right. This is called shit talking with James Marsters, not James Marsden. <laughs> Marsden exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay, these are questions. James from- Marsden doesn't have a podcast. Yeah, screw Marcus. you. Now His he will. podcast now he will. is something different, and it's not as interesting as mine. Yes, thank you. Because he may be pretty or I am, Does he have a podcast? I have a brain. Um, no. I have no idea. I don't think so. Probably not. He has enough. Ha ha. He doesn't need to do this. No. Leave us alone. James, don't do a podcast. James, leave us Please, alone, just man. Come on, give me a break. All right, these are my top tier patrons. Um... I love you. Patreon.com slash inside of you. Join Patreon today. Support the podcast. We need you. Little Lisa says, favorite breakfast cereal as a kid. When I was a kid, we made our own granola. And it was god awful. (laughs) It was just, we were hippies. So, and we would always overdo it. So it was slightly burned. It was just horrible. And then we were made to eat it. You know, we just had to eat it. You had to eat it. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Like I said, and then you child. then then with your first wife, you had to have oatmeal and cream of wheat, and then back to oatmeal. Breakfast was never really good for you. No, I don't eat it now. Well, there you go. You I fast have, to I like have, one or two. Yeah, breakfast. Yeah, two o'clock. I have a little piece, little spoon of peanut butter in the morning until about two o'clock. That's there it. You go. We're Sarah after. G, is there a role you haven't played yet that you really want to play badly? I missed my chance at Hamlet. That would be the one. Yeah, because Hamlet's young. Yeah, that's the whole point. Like Hamlet, Hamlet you could play him in your thirties, right? Yeah, but you ha- you would have to believably, at least in stage, be be able to be eighteen and have that be believable. So if you're thirty, like, you probably because Hamlet, like the whole point of Hamlet is like to be or not to be, and that's basically a teenager turning to the audience and asking them directly, "Hey guys, I'm thinking of killing myself, and I'm just asking you, why haven't you guys killed yourself? What is it that kept you?" from killing yourself because I'm looking at the world and it's really messed up and I kind of want to leave. So help me out. What kept you guys here? And when, when, when a teenager asks that question, it's a profound question. When a 40 year old actor asks that question, you're like, Oh, shut up. Yeah. You know, so you have, you have to be able to bring off. Could you recite Hamlet right now easily? Yeah. And you hadn't never done it. No. And you could still recite it. Yeah. Can you recite many plays? Some, but not all. What's your favorite play of all time? Macbeth. Macbeth. Yeah. You did Macbeth. Oh, yeah. I did Macbeth. I played um, uh, Ross. Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> it's called The Evil, the most miraculous work of this good king, which since my here remain in England, I have seen him do. How he solicited the Antborn. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. I, awesome. I still remember some of that. It's, with Shakespeare, it's hard to forget it. It is, yeah, because you're so focused on the meaning and like really like. This is the best one I know. This is the best. This is Caliban from the Tempest. Be not afeard. The isle is full of noises, sounds, and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about my ears, and sometimes voices that, if I then had waked after long sleep, would make me sleep again. That I think is the most beautiful thing he ever. That's wrote. great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would have loved to seen like Olivier or somebody like you know. Uh, William K. What role have you played that you thought was amazing but hasn't received the attention you think it should? 
Uh, I've been very lucky. All the things that I've felt really needed to be seen, I've been seen. We're seen. But yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, they tended the plays that I was in that I'm really proud of. They tended to sell well. The shows that I would hope that would be forgotten or forgotten. The, yes, the movies. Well, maybe not wish. now that we brought them up. <laughs> you notice that I didn't give you a long list of the movies that I did. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, to pay the bills. Um, uh, but I'm very lucky. I, I don't feel underappreciated at all. I feel probably, if anything, overappreciated. Good. Elizabeth yeah. L., if you could work with any actor or actress, past Meryl or present, Streep. who would it be? Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep. Have you ever she, been... is like, she is like Miles Davis, and the rest of us are like Millie Vanilli. I swear to God. She's, she's so on brilliant. a different level she's so brilliant. of artistry. I got she, to hang out with her. She is like... I was enamored. If and you she... go back and look at Brando... And then look at Meryl Streep. It's obvious that, okay, Brando was coming from people who weren't doing it this way. They weren't being real like that yet. And so he was revolutionizing everything. So you can excuse him for not being nearly as good as Meryl Streep. Yeah. Meryl Streep built on what Brando and, and uh, everyone who came before gave her, you know, but she just took it to a whole different level. Yeah, I love her. She's and amazing. you know what's, uh, what I noticed? Is when I met her, and it was through one of her friends, and I was at their house. You met Meryl Streep. Oh yeah, I hung out with. Her for I'm hours. glad I have not met Meryl Streep. But let me I tell you something. She collapse. made me feel at ease, like that. Oh. And I was like, "Yeah, you know, blah blah." And she goes, <laughs> and she starts laughing, and she's so her voice is so soft, and she was just, she was like, "Oh my god, I I remember that. I remember." And we she, we were telling stories, and she was she just felt like just a, she was a fun person. She wasn't all serious and, and Jessica Chastain, <laughs> who I, I, I like a lot. And See, that makes me even more like her, even more, which means I, I mean, I would just fanboy out even more. Kristen B., any behind the scenes stories you could share working with me and Tom Willing during Smallville, which you probably talked about last time, but it's been a while. Yeah, we talked. Uh, no, 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 no. I just remember that, yeah, we talked about it. They, yeah. they wanted us to fight so bad. They wanted us to hate each other for the press. And you and I liked each other. We just gave them nothing. I was like, yeah, he's remember? great. He just, yeah. does, he's, he's perfect. <laughs> it's like we're having a great time. He's a great actor. I'm yeah. having fun. I'm having fun. <laughs> what do you, what are you gonna do? Yeah. Don G, what do you love to act in movies, TV, or theater the most? Theater. Theater, boy, uh, without a doubt. Yeah. Are you gonna do more theater? Yeah. I don't know. Like I always thought I, at some point my kids would get out of college and I would go back and do theater. Um, and they're still in college. Man. It seems all come th out. that the further you get away from doing theater, that's what happened to me. Uh -huh. The less I wanted to do it uh -huh. because I, I did a lot of theater in college and then I was doing some off Broadway stuff in New York. And then I got flown out to LA, landed a movie, landed a show. And the next thing you know, 20 years passed me by. Yeah. And I haven't yeah. done a play since. And I'm not so sure I could deal with a schedule of eight shows every night, the stress, the, you know. I'm not sure I would I would enjoy that. But maybe I would. I would like to find out if I would enjoy that or not. I'll be honest. I would like to go back and see if I can still swim in that pool. I'm, I, I, it's yeah. like riding a bike probably for you. But you did a lot more theater. than I'm, I, I've probably I done so 25 much. plays in my life. That's about it. That's a good amount. I've probably done 100. But yeah. Is, yeah, I've done a hundred. Well, well, no, I mean that, that's twenty five yeah. is a lot of plays. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Um, who is your? Who have you gotten starstruck by when you've met them? Leonard Nimoy. Really? <laughs> it was horrible. I it would. I wish I would have met him. I was. So, I'm such a Star Trek fan. What'd you say to him? I just climbed all over him. They. they I was at a convention, and and sometimes when you're in the green room, um you're actually still on because the other actors are actually fans of what you've done. Yeah. So they're asking you for autographs and the other, and, and there's nowhere to go to relax and just have some downtime so you can recoup your energy and go back and be with the fans and have, you have a good time there. And so you need a break. Right. So sometimes they'll give certain actors their own room so they can have some quiet. And, I was experiencing this in the green room. I still had blonde hair. I was on Buffy and, and I was getting a lot of attention in the green room. So they shuttled me off to this private room where Leonard was also sitting. And he's had, trying to have a break. And he's like 70 something years old. He needs a break. And 
I was like, oh my God, I'm the biggest fan of you. This is what happened. Thank I'm just, you. Thank oh you my very much. God. And he was, you could just see him oh, going, oh shit. God, there's no safe place. Blonde you. Right I was there. just it's like, not that he thinks I'm a bad person, but I just cannot get away from the fact that everyone Did he wants smoke? to talk to Spock. Uh, no, not in the green room at no, the no. time. <laughs> yeah, was right. he smoking in the green room? <laughs> um, but yeah, I always felt bad about that. I could not be cool. I could not keep it together in front of him. Oh, there's nothing wrong yeah, with that. Um, well, what I realized is that I just wanted I've to applaud. That. I just wanted, like, like when you're Did in you a, get him to sign something. No, no, Damn they yeah. they got him out pretty quickly. Mm, <laughs> I, I would have gotten to sign he something. He signaled, he signaled somebody, and he was whisked away. And he's probably, he probably, he was probably in the bathroom in the stall because that's the only place that he could get private, just sitting there. <laughs> you know, um, but <laughs> but yeah, I think what what I realized was is that that I just wanted to. Uh, uh, applaud um because like I, I was in plays where you'd be in the first act and you wouldn't be in the second act or third act or you wouldn't be in the last scene at least and you could go home early you could go home an hour and a half early but you have to sit backstage like a good little boy just so that you could go on stage and bow and right. then, then you go home right. and when you're doing nine or eleven shows a week you really wish you could go home you just yeah. like the applause is not like that's and you realize that the applause is not for the actors. Everyone thinks, oh, actors live for applause. No, we really don't. It's for it's so the the audience has a chance to join the conversation and 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 have their voice. And there's different kinds of applause. There's like, wow, we think you're amazing. There's, yeah, we're not gonna ask for our money back. And there's why did you waste our time? You know, like there's all you can tell. You know, there's a message given in that applause. And I had been watching Leonard Amoy for years and I had never had a chance to applaud. And I just had this overwhelming need to say- Did he smile? I love you. He grimaced in a friendly way. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, like, but I was- like Yoda. I was taking away his, his, one, his one moment of silence. I've had some moments where I was starstruck, like meeting Jack Nicholson and hanging with him back at the Lakers game in the chairman's room at the time when they use the chairman's room. I think yeah. they still do, but he was in the cigar room. And I just went in, I didn't know he was in there. And I was having a cigarette at the time years yeah. ago. Yeah. And I go, I just was like, oh man, I hope we can win this one. He goes, well, you know, Shaq's hurt right now. And, you know, you hope Kobe could come. And he starts talking about the game with me. And I'm like, yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, how long have you been doing coming here? And I was like, you know, hockey's my sport. He's well, I never really got into hockey as yeah. much, but uh, and we had this like all of a sudden I'm talking and I'm and I'm starstruck. There's no yeah. way around it, and I'm doing yeah. the best acting of my life to make him think I'm not starstruck Good. that I'm just a dude. Yeah. And this one guy walks in and goes. Jack! And I go, oh, fuck. And he goes, this game, man, not as good as it gets, huh? <laughs> and Jack goes, if you'll excuse me, and walked out. And I go, you you fuck. Yeah. And the guy goes, what? He goes, I go, you just ruined my moment. I was talking with Jack. And he just, he goes, dude, sorry. I'm like, God damn. Yeah. Because um, you were just talking to a human being. I was just talking. About, yeah, we were just talking sport. sports and having yeah. a nice moment. Yeah. This yeah. has been a joy. Yeah. Oh my God! Is it over? It's over. Schmackters. Damn it! Well, I do have to pee again. So yeah. Okay. Well, Schmackters, listen to this podcast. If you like this guy, if you love this interview, give it a shot. I know you will. You're gonna have a lot of fun with it too. And um, I always root for you. Anything else that you want to throw out there? Promote? Do it. Yeah. There's a really good show on Amazon Prime called Casa Grande that I'm really proud of. Yes. I really wanted to get a second season. It's an update of Upstairs Downstairs. Uh, a third of it is in subtitles because it's 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 about um, wine growers and ranchers in Napa Valley, and then uh, the Latinos that work the land. And both sides are human beings, and there's a cultural gulf in between them. And wow. and it is it is phenomenally beautiful. It's really well shot. There was an Argent award winning Argentinian director that came in uh, to do it. Uh, had such a good experience. And who do you play? I, I play a jerk, a lovable jerk. Yeah, yeah, with a cowboy hat. It was cool. Did you have to speak any Spanish at all? No, no. But you have to know a lot about wine. Two, uh, no. I had to act like I knew something about wine. But my I, my character made the bad wine. I was the richest guy because I made the I made the mediocre wine, and I I was all, all after money. And the first is Casa Grande. Casa Grande. It's Casa on Grande. Amazon Prime. Large yeah. home. Is that what it stands for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's just very well acted, very well written. I'm very proud of it, and I'm really hoping to do more. 
I love, any cons yeah. coming up? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So look on your if they go to your Instagram at uh, uh real James Marsters. Real James Marsters. Marsters. And you can see his like mouse where turds. he's gonna be, all that stuff. You could talk to this guy. Ghost the Robot just put out a new album. Ghost the Robot. Ago. You started yeah. that band in two thousand four? Two thousand one, I think. One. Yeah. But yeah, we just put Ten Men out. That's available on iTunes. Dude. Place. Yeah, with it. And that's a really good album. We just we just went into the studio and just played as a band. Live, and, yeah. So you didn't just, really like, all the a click track. No, it just was live. Well, no, we all had the. You have to. Well, the drummer has a click, and then we're all following the drummer. Oh, gotcha, but, like, gotcha. but but like we and we did some overlaying afterwards. We did some harmonies and some extra guitars in it. But but the the, the spine of the thing we got just in one take, just boom. And it's that so it's awesome. kind of like the Stones is that out? tapes. Yeah, yeah. So what's the name of the album again? Tin Man. Tin Man. Yeah. And, you know, you can get it. We're on Spotify. We're on iTunes. You can get it anywhere. I mean, he's done a ton of stuff. Check out Casa Grande. Check out the band. Check and out. And Curses on Jesus, Apple Plus. Curses? Curses. It's for kids. It's a cartoon. But it's really cool. It's a, it, takes, it takes like Indiana Jones where white people are going into uh, foreign cultures and stealing their stuff. Which is, you know, really problematic if you think about yes. it. Yes. So it's a bunch. History. It's a family that is, that is trying to give back. The artifacts that that their uh that their dad stole <laughs> ah, that's really interesting yeah yeah gosh if we could really do that in real life wouldn't that be nice you know like give uh mexicans back two million square miles of their land wouldn't that you be know nice? wouldn't that be nice it would be great you know yeah. maybe uh the native american i mean we can go on anyway yeah. <laughs> thank you for being on the show yeah. i love you and i always wish you the best hell yeah it's so good to see you my brother he's just he's he's so articulate and he's been around. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, he's he's maybe a little older than me, but like, I kind of feel like he's got it figured out now. You know, it's like, I don't know how mm -hmm. long it takes to figure out who we are, or who we think we are, or, you know, um, but I feel like a lot of his wall, the walls that we have as we're actors and this and trying to be relevant, I think those walls are sort of stripped down. He knows who he is. He knows what he wants. He knows what he does, and he does it well. Mm -hmm. And he's a talented, talented guy, and I really loved having him on the podcast again. He's a great guest. James, you'll have to come back, and uh, thank you. And, uh, again, if you enjoy this podcast, please support the show and come back and visit us and join Patreon if you want to. Patreon.com slash inside of you. And right now all the top tiers get their names shouted out, um, and we love all of you equally you're amazing and um also september 28th we're doing another sunspin virtual show so get tickets go to sunspin.com and uh we're doing a show because we're preparing for our album and trying to um get enough money to pay for all our studio session members and band members studios uh session players uh, -huh. uh you know all that stuff but the album's going to be really cool. In fact, Blake Lewis is producing my album. Cool. Me and Rob's album, Sunspin's album. And Blake Lewis, a friend of mine, he was like the runner-up on uh, American Idol many years ago. Mm -hmm. And he's incredibly talented. And so this album has a, has a chance to sound different. And we'll see what happens. But uh, let's get into the top tiers. Thank you guys so much. Patreon.com slash inside of you. Nancy D, Leah, and Kristen, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Nico P, Robert B, Jason W., Sophie M. Raj C. Jennifer N. Stacy L. Janelle B. Mike. Eldon Scremo. <laughs> 99 more. Santiago M. Leanne P. Maddie S. Kendrick F. Belinda N. Yes, Leanne P. Hello, Leanne P. And hello, Maddie S. And hello, Kendrick. Belinda N. Dave Hall. Brad D. Ray Harada. Tab of the T. Tom N. Talia M. Betsy D. I miss you. Rhiannon C, I love your name. Corey K, Dev Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Mr. M, and Eugene and Leah. Come on. <laughs> the Salty Ham, Mel S, Eric H, Oracle, Amanda R, William K, Kevin E, Jor L, Jim and J, Leanne J, Luna R, Mike F, Jules M. Uh, I ran out of steam. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Good Lord, son. Jessica B, Kaylee J, Charlene A, Marion Louise L, Romeo the Band. Frank B, Jen T, Nikki L, April R, M, uh, Randy S, Rachel D, Jan Carolina Girl, Nick W, Stephanie Evan or Stefan, Charlene A, Don G. I'll just read them out. Go ahead. Jenny B, 76, Jennifer R, Tina E, NG Tracy, and our good friend Keith B, Heather and Greg, who we adore, Ellie K, Elizabeth L, Ben B. Jammin, man, Pierre C, Sultan, Ingrid C, Brandon C, Ronit, L, 
Ronan's back. Oh. Ronan, thanks for, uh, you know, giving back to the podcast and becoming a patron. Give some love, guys, to Ronan. Write him on uh, Patreon. You guys should all be talking. It's a family here, for God's sakes. All right. That's <laughs> it from the Hollywood Hills in Hollywood, California. I'm Michael Rosenbaum. I love right there. I'm here, too. Yeah, a little wave <laughs> to the camera. We love you guys. Be good to yourself, and I'll see you next week.